When I discuss uh, my philosophy with the religious types, um, a lot of them object that um, you live in a very cold, empty universe. Um, without God, the life isn't worth living, etc., etc. Uh, well, I've dealt with that question, is life worth living with or without God? And <laughs> it's been thoroughly dealt with, and I have a strange suspicion that it's more accurately uh, described and it's more worth living in a non-theistic context than in a theistic one. The reason for that is, at least in the Abrahamic faiths, and to a certain extent all the other ones, the universe is, to, is, is split in two. It's either split into pure, impure, light, dark, good, evil, that kind of thing. And all the good stuff and the pure stuff and the nice stuff is all nice, we all want that, but we push the other stuff away from us. And as we know, in phenomenal reality, the more you push these things away from you, the more they follow you. Um, we've spent the last 2,000 years, especially since the Enlightenment, to banish evil from our lives, and it just keeps reappearing. <laughs> if you want to call it evil, just call it suffering. Um, <clears throat> now, an interesting apostle of love is the last person you would think who would be such a person or fulfill such a role is Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, he has a concept that a lot of people don't really zero in on that much called amor fati, love of your fate. Um, loving something, especially that which you're not inclined to love, is a pretty fascinating concept and um, it's not anything particularly new. I'm always bringing up this, um, Mother Kali, who um, evokes um, intense love in her followers in India. Uh, but again, that's theistic, and that's not really the thrust of this. Um, another theistic one is this, the image of the crucifixion. Um, the entire point in the ancient world of crucifying somebody was to humiliate them, make them suffer the most that you could possibly get a human to suffer, the worst possible death, and the most spectacularly public and humiliating death. The Christians grabbed that and turned that into uh, a symbol of their conquest of suffering and their conquest of evil. Again, the evil thing I have issues with. I Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so here's Nietzsche on Amor Fati. I have another quote um, by Swami Vivekananda, which is kind of non-theistic. Um, in fact, I would say it is non-theistic, but uh, Nietzsche is a good one, because he, of all people, is the last person you'd think would be talking about love, the way he normally sneers at people. Um, he sneers the way I smirk. <laughs> um, anyway, Nietzsche on Amor Fati. My formula for human greatness is Amor Fati. Notice he said greatness that one wants nothing to be different, not in the future, not in the past, not for all eternity. Not only to endure what is necessary, still less to conceal it. All idealism is falseness in the face of necessity, but to love it. Love everything. Jettison your idealism and bring on the love. Think of that. <laughs> Interesting, interesting yin and yang thing there. Um, not uh, not love of the good. Love of everything. Love of your life. Love of your fate. Love of your suffering. Um, Swami Vivekananda says the same thing in Karma Yoga, one of his works. Swami Vivekananda was a 19th century uh, Hindu reformer slash um, philosopher who brought Eastern philosophy to the West. Um, I quote, The goal of man is knowledge. That is the one great ideal placed before us by Eastern philosophy. Not pleasure, but knowledge is the goal of man. Pleasure and happiness come to an end. It is a mistake to suppose that pleasure is the goal. The cause of all the miseries we have in the world is that men foolishly think pleasure to be the ideal to strive for. After a time, a man finds that it is not happiness, but knowledge towards which he is going, and that both, both pleasure and pain are great teachers, and that he learns as much from pain as from pleasure. 
As pleasure and pain pass before his soul, they leave, a, they leave upon it different pictures, and the result of these combined impressions is what is called a man's character. If you take the character of any man, it is really but the aggregate of tendencies, the sum total of the inclinations of his mind. You will find that misery and happiness are equal factors in the formation of that character. Happiness and misery have an equal share in molding character. And in some instances, misery is a better teacher than happiness. Were one to study the great characters the world has produced, I dare say it would be found, in the vast majority of cases, that misery taught them more than happiness. Poverty taught them more than wealth. Blows brought out the inner fire more than praise. One could say that that's just... Um, sort of a, an epistle of pessimism, but it's not. <laughs> He's saying um, suffering is something that you must not avoid. Um, you must embrace it in a certain way because suffering is what's going to teach you what life is, what existence is. And he um, says, blows brought out their inner fire more than praise inner fire. Tapas, that's the, the Hindu concept of, um, I don't know, he, so many different images, but it's essentially, I guess, enlightenment. <clears throat> and it's, you know, it's a profoundly desirable state. <laughs> um, interesting tie-in there, though. Eh? Why, Vivekananda, you could say, is theistic, but you don't, one, one needn't be a theist to actually appreciate his work. He's quite cerebral. Um... But it's interesting how he says suffering is necessary. You must suffer. You must walk over that uh, pile of glowing coals in order to get to the gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, and that there is no way around that bed of hot coals. <laughs> um, another Nietzsche quote um, that uh, sort of fleshes it out in a much more poetic fashion, and Nietzsche, of course, the ultimate poet, um, amor fati. This is the very core of my being. And as to my prolonged illness, do I not owe much more to it than I owe to my health? To it I owe a higher kind of health, a sort of health which grows stronger until everything that does not actually kill it, or go, grows stronger under everything that does not actually kill it. To it I owe even my philosophy. Only great suffering is the ultimate emancipator of spirit, for it teaches us, uh, teaches one that vast suspiciousness which makes an X out of every U, a genuine and proper X, i.e., the great antepenultimate letter. I <laughs> love that. Only great suffering, that great suffering under which we seem to be over a fire of greenwood, the suffering that takes its time, mm -hmm forces us philosophers to descend into our nethermost depths and to let go of all trustfulness, all good nature, all whittling down, all mildness, all mediocrity, on which things we had formerly staked our humanity. <laughs> um, I guess there's a backhand criticism of Christianity there. Um, He's saying, don't embrace your suffering the way those Christians do it. Um, in that you're martyring yourself before the evils of this universe. Love the evil as well. Uh, or at least what these people call evil. Um, it says, uh, as to, he said in the quote, as to my prolonged illness, do I not owe much more to it than I owe to my health? He was a sickly person all of his life, lonely, lived a... A very withdrawn life, cerebral, um, ivory towerish kind of existence, cut off from other people to a certain extent. Um, you know, headaches that prostrated him for three days. You know, had a pharmacy on his nightstand and um, bad health all of his life. And he said, basically, this is what taught me. Um, I like the line, um, only great suffering, that great suffering under which we seem to be over a fire of greenwood, 
In other words, it's smoky and lingering and it's almost a polluting kind of fire. The suffering that takes its time. <laughs> um, he would know all about that. <laughs> um, apparently he had syphilis, but he had a whole pile of other things. Some people say he actually had brain cancer. Nice. Nice way to die. My mother died of that. It's not a nice way to die. Um, and yet he says, look, uh, this is how to achieve um, true wisdom, true knowledge, exactly what you want out of life. Love everything. Love your horrific three-day headaches that prevent you from walking or even seeing um, because they're teaching you things. Um, I like the uh, the quote from, I've actually, I think I've got it memorized, uh, from the movie Jacob's Ladder, where Danny Aiello's char character quotes Meister Eckhart, or paraphrases him. He says, um, when you're afraid of dying, um, and you feel your life being torn away from you, and it scares you, and you're surrounded by devils, um, be careful with thinking that. Um, they're not punishing you. Um, they're actually freeing your soul. Uh, there, it's your own attachments to everything, to your own little place in the universe, your ego or whatever, um, that's actually causing you to suffer. Those things that look like devils are actually angels freeing your soul. They're not punishing you. They're trying to help you. Now, that's, of course, a very Christian context, but that's, it's, it's, it's the same thing, if you ask me. Um... You turn the good evil thing on its head, uh, not in a satanic kind of sense where bad is good and good is bad. Everything is good, but you have to know how to look at it. You have to know how to interpret it. You have to know how to see it. Now, one could say that here in the, you know, rich part of the world, we can say that, uh, oh yeah, it's all very well for us to say that because we've been insulated from suffering. No, we haven't. Our suffering is just as severe as the worst slum, uh, the, the, that of the worst slum dweller in uh, in the poorest part of the world, but our suffering is very different. We suffer from other things. We suffer from depression, listlessness, acedia, um, lack of focus on anything, um, anxiety. Uh, all the stuff that was normally ascribed usually to aristocrats is now very common in the West. We suffer about things that you would think um, wouldn't really make people suffer. And we have these horrible terms like first world problems, which sort of tells us your suffering is not valid. Um, that that first world problems sort of cliche, I really have an issue with. Uh, because you can have a big house and, you know, lots of money and, you know, a babe in each room or whatever, and you can still be about as miserable as a human being can possibly be. Uh, again, hmm, be careful when you think that uh, pleasure is the goal, because you get all the pleasure you want and you end up still suffering and you don't even know why. But I think that it's very arrogant of people to say that suffering is to be avoided in all cases, um, because suffering is part of life, um, and if you want to understand life, if you want to understand what a human being is, if you want to understand what you are, then you're going to have to understand what suffering actually is and what it can do and how it can be used. Um, I would say that Amor Fati, um, embracing everything, loving your suffering um, is a wonderful ideal uh, given to us by the very person who said <laughs> basically shove all ideals where the sun don't shine but again it's it's not really an ideal is it it's just something it's a technique that one can use to come to terms with suffering and overcome it the Christians were very good at this I, you have to give them credit for that but they had that Manichaean view of light and dark, good and evil. That was where I think they fell down. And that's where, ironically, they met their match in Nietzsche in the love department. <laughs> Theists always tell me, um, your universe is empty and cold 
I say, yours is terrifying.